you're going to expect it to be kind of uh, evenly distributed over all the chapters. So there's going to be like maybe 60 to 70 questions, multiple choice mainly, and some equation writing. But out of those 60 or 70 questions, you've got to spread it out over all the chapters. So chapter one, there was a, really wasn't too much to it, I think. But uh, what it boils down to is maybe five to you know 10 questions per chapter more or less depending on what we cover. And so uh, those are going to be multiple choice and then you're going to have some equation writing so you'll have to review nomenclature which I mentioned last week at the end and uh, reactions. Okay. Those will be bonus points so they're going to be you know the final is going to be worth about 180 points and there's going to be about 18 points worth of bonus possible on the final. Okay. If you could do those chemical reactions. All right, now, what, what are we going to do for these? Well, I, I said, um, you know, chapter 16 was the last full chapter. You know, um, what we're going to do is we're co covering 17. 17 deals with acids and bases. I decided to cover acids and bases when I was talking about the chemical reactions earlier. And so we already covered a lot of the acid-base chapter. 18 is equilibrium, and so it's a dynamic equilibrium. So I'll talk about more about that. And then 19 is redox. So again, we did redox, but we're going to look at one application. And so for the homework, uh, this is what I want for the homework. Um, you know, for chapters 17, 18, and um, 19 homework. <coughs> What you're going to do is um, you're going to just take notes, and you're going to turn in your notes. I want to see your notes for chapter 17, 18, and 19. You know your lecture notes. So just submit those for your homework, and then I'll, I'll take those. So make sure you take some notes. Is that clear? So I'm not going to give you out of uh, out of the chapter. We're going to do some examples in class. I want you to work on understanding the examples that we do. Not just acid-base reactions, but um, also the concept of pH as well. Well, when we have an acid-base reaction, this is a proton transfer reaction. This is a proton transfer according to the Bronsted definition. So this is a Bronsted acid-base reaction. Now Lewis is, uh, is different. And so Bronsted acid-base You know, in Bronsted, the acid is the H plus donor. The base is the H plus um, taker. You know, it takes the H plus. It's really the, the base is going to attack the acid and try to take the uh, H plus. That's Bronsted. Um, this is Bronsted Lowry. However, Lewis is a bit different. You know what Lewis, the definition for Lewis is? Lewis, an acid, is an electron pair acceptor. And the base is an electron pair donor. So the Lewis, um, one thing you should know about the Lewis definition is this is the most comprehensive definition. This is the most all-encompassing, complete definition. 
and so most comprehensive definition. Bronstadt is a, a subset of the acids. And, um, you know, Bronstadt, not all, um, not all acids fit into this category. Not all acids and bases fit. to this uh, definition. However, um, it's very uh, useful. You know, this subset of acids that are proton donors and bases that are proton acceptors are very common. And so, to, there's a third definition. The third definition is called Arrhenius, and Arrhenius is not that useful for us. Uh, Arrhenius is, um, acids are H plus, Things that give H plus in solution. And so Arrhenius, we expect H plus in Arrhenius acid. Arrhenius base gives hydroxide. And so Arrhenius is the least comprehensive. Least comprehensive. And therefore, uh, we don't spend any time on it. It's too limiting of a definition of acids and bases. Uh, historically. And so Arrhenius acid gives H plus in solution. Arrhenius base gives OH minus in solution. And so Bron Bronsted is a little bit more uh, broad and then uh, Lewis is the most broad or the most comprehensive of the definitions. Well, we're going to really uh, focus on is Bronsted. And in Bronsted acid base reactions we have just a proton transfer. That's it. You have different degrees. For example, things like a solution can become more acidic. As they get they become more acidic, um, usually we get more H plus in solution. As things become less acidic, then we get less H plus and then more hydroxide in solution. We'll talk about that in terms of pH. So strong acids would be more acidic, strong bases would be more basic, and then we have you know, moderate acids and bases. And here are some acid-base reactions. This is a acid-base reaction with, with calcium carbonate. Um, and in fact, this would be a metathesis or Bronsted. A reaction. And so let's take a look at that reaction here. So acids well um, one uh, we have a metathesis style reaction. And so we, we pick an acid Let's say a common acid like HCl. Geologists carry around a bottle of HCl to test rocks and minerals to see if they contain carbonates. Because if a rock or mineral contains cal like calcium carbonate or some other carbonate, then uh, we'll have a favorable reaction here. Uh, what forms? Can you tell me what forms in this particular reaction? Calcium chloride. Yeah, what's the formula for calcium chloride? CaCl2. CaCl2, correct. That's good. Sorry. CaCl2. Is that soluble or insoluble? Calcium chloride. It's soluble. It's soluble. <coughs> Chlorides are all soluble except for silver, lead, and mercury. And carbonic acid. But one thing about carbonic acid, which has the formula H2CO3, that you should have memorized is what? It breaks down into H2O. Yeah, it breaks down. So you can't leave it here in this form. So it's going to break down into H2O liquid plus CO2 gas. So I'm going to write a little arrow here indicating that this decomposes right away. You aren't going to find much 
with any carbonic acid. Or let's balance this out. If we balance this out, well, we have two chlorines here. We'll need two chlorines here, so we'll have two HCLs, one calcium, one calcium. Then it looks like it balances out. When we balance, it's easier to balance with carbonic acid. With carbonic acid, we have two hydrogen ions and one carbonate ion. Two hydrogen ions, one carbonate, it's balanced. And then each carbonic acid yields one H2O liquid and one CO liquid gas. What's the driving force for this reaction? Yeah, stronger acid to weaker acid. What is the stronger acid? HCl. So we could say stronger acid. What is the weaker acid? Carbonic acid. Carbonic acid would be the weaker acid, or it's CO2. CO2, do you know CO2 is an acid? But CO2 does not fit the Bronsted definition. CO2, does it have an H plus it can donate? But no, there's no hydrogen in CO2. CO2 fits the Lewis definition of an acid. So this is a Lewis acid. However, car well, carbonic acid is a um, Bronsted acid, and, and then this could just be the driving force because initially we're going to form carbonic, which decomposes into H2O liquid and CO2. And so in this particular reaction, you know, we want to point out which of these is a stronger acid, you know, and which is a weaker. And so I'd like a little arrow to show that. That's metathesis. That's one type of reaction. Now, when um, an acid reacts with zinc, like in this one here, zinc reacts with hydrochloric acid, is that an acid-base reaction? Is it metathesis or acid-base? Metathesis and acid-base is an interchange. No, the second reaction there shown in the um, figure is not. Okay, if you came in late, the homework for this chapter is going to be your lecture notes. I just want to check the lecture notes to see what you wrote for this. And so make sure you take notes. That's going to be your homework. It's 10 points per chapter, 30 points. Well, when we look at that, zinc reacts with hydrochloric acid. Zinc reacts with hydrochloric acid is not an acid-base reaction. What kind of reaction is that? It looks like single replacement, which would draw into redox. And so, um, you know, uh, reactions of acids, we can have it. Um, acids are oxidizers. You know, what is doing the oxidizing? What's doing the oxidizing is H plus, in this case. H plus. And so this would fit the single replacement form because um, you know H plus is going to be the best oxidizer. Chloride's not an oxidizer, and water is not a very good oxidizer. And so this should fit. This shouldn't be an exception. So this should form what? Zinc chloride. What's the formula for zinc chloride? ZnCl2. Yeah, ZnCl2. Is that um, soluble or insoluble? It's soluble. And what else form? H2O? Not H2O. Where's the oxygen coming in from here? Just H, but H alone is not stable. H2. H2 is a gas. It's a nonpolar molecule, so it's not very soluble in water, so it won't be AQ. It'll be gaseous and just bubble out. That's what we see over here in the slide, bubbles of H2 gas form. All right, let's balance this. Two HCLs. Right. Now, is there a driving force for this? What is the driving force for single replacement? Somebody remind me. Gas formation is not a driving force for redox. 
gas formation is not. Gas formation is a driving force for metathesis. In fact, we could have had more driving forces over here. What's another driving force for this reaction? Yeah, gas formation. That's another driving force for this. Gas formation is perfectly fine for metathesis, but gas formation does not work for redox. We have to come up with a different driving force for this. Precipitation. Precipitation does not work for... Yeah, strong to weak reducer. That's exactly right. Or we, we can call it by the activity series. You know, an activity series would be the strength of the reducer. So when we look at the activity series, you know, what's the most powerful reducer? Lithium. Therefore, it's at the top. This is activity series for reducer. Um, we are also going to have a different activity series for oxidizer, too. But let's take a look. Zinc versus hydrogen. What's a better reducer? What's a better, or what's more active? Zinc is here. And then where's hydrogen? Down there. So what's a better reducer? Hydrogen or zinc? Zinc. Zinc. And so what we're doing is we're going from, you know, if we use single replacement, we call it more active zinc to less active hydrogen. This is our driving force. So that's redox. What, what other um, types of reactions are there? have um, metathesis, redox, and and acid base. Yeah. Now for metathesis, we got to consider one other thing, and that is the anion. This is a metathesis. Hydrogen ions like carbonate ions here. But we also have must consider the anion here. Must also consider anion, chloride. Well, we do that in double replacement here. Yeah. Or other anion, depending if we have some other acid, other anion. Also here, um, we also must consider the anion here, because the anion might be a more powerful oxidizer or a more powerful reducer. So must also factor in the anion. But those are your standard. So we did this, um, right? We talked about these reactions, correct? Uh, earlier. And so you want to review that, of course. All right, let's take a look at a Bronsted-Lowry um, acid-base reaction. Here, um, I have ammonia. Ammonia is actually amphoteric. It go either way. Ammonia can act either as an acid or a base. And we have water. We have ammonia and water here. And so what, what I do in a, a Bronsted acid-base reaction this is using the Bronsted method, well, actually, is to figure out which is the stronger acid, ammonia or water. That's going to be the acid, because both of these can go either way. And so if I have ammonia and water, ammonia is an acid and a base, water is an acid and a base. And so what I'll do is I'll just take a look at the chart. I'll let's go to the chart here. Well, we have to pick the strongest. So we're going to compare ammonia 
versus water. Which one's a stronger acid? Yeah, the acids are on the left here. So if you look at water versus ammonia, which one's a stronger acid? Water is a stronger acid, so water should act as the acid. Okay, then which one's a stronger base? And so we're going to look at ammonia, which is here on the base side, versus water. Okay, so here is ammonia, here is water. Which one's a stronger base? Ammonia. Ammonia is a much stronger base than water. And so ammonia is going to act as a base. Then what happens in an acid-base reaction, Bronsted acid-base reaction? What happens is the base takes a hydrogen ion from the acid. And so what, what's going to happen here is this. I'll write it H3N. Normally we write it in H3. There's a lone pair on nitrogen here. And so what's going to happen here is that the base takes the hydrogen. So the base is going to attack and take this hydrogen, but it wants the H plus, so it's going to leave these electrons behind. Like that. And so what ends up forming is this. What ends up forming is um, Nitrogen now with four hydrogens. Nitrogen with four hydrogens is AKA NH4, but it's going to have a positive charge, plus. So we call it NH4 plus. And this oxygen is now going to have three lone pairs. And it's going to actually, I should just do this via Lewis structures. Easier to see. Sorry, let me just modify this here. NH four plus and Nitrogen here has a positive formal charge. The oxygen here is going to have a negative formal charge. This is going to make hydroxide. So ammonium and hydroxide. Now, is there a driving force for this reaction? What is the driving force for acid base? Strong base to weak base. Yeah. All right, strong. It doesn't have to be strong, just stronger base to weaker base and stronger acid to weaker acid. So what was ammonia role here? Ammonia is the base. What's water? The acid. Okay, now if I were to reverse this reaction and go backwards, ammonium, is that the acid or the base going backwards? Is it gaining a proton? Is ammonium going to take a hydrogen? The base takes the hydrogen. So ammonium, is it going to take the last hydrogen away from oxygen? Going backwards. No, actually hydroxide is going to take the hydrogen going backwards. If we go backwards, we'll see. Hydroxide is going to form water. Ammonium is going to form ammonia. So this is going to be the acid. This is going to be the base in the reverse direction. Now, let's um, take a look at the strengths here on the acid-base chart and compare the two acids. So the two acids are going to be water versus 
ammonium. Water versus ammonium. Okay, which one's a stronger acid? Water versus ammonium. Which one's a stronger acid? Ammonium. So ammonium's stronger, water's weaker. Let's take it, the bases have to follow the same pattern because of the conjugate type relationship. If we look at the bases, which one's a better base, ammonia or hydroxide? Ammonia or hydroxide? Ammonia is considered a weak base. Hydroxide is considered a strong base. So we should, shouldn't even need to chart for that. This is going to be weaker. This is going to be stronger. And so what we say is that there's no driving force. Correct? No driving force. Hmm? Yeah. Actually, the driving force should be in the opposite direction. The driving force is going backwards. But does that count? Um, so there, would there be driving force if you had to go backwards? There would be a driving force going backwards, but we're not going backwards, we're going forward. And so what we come up with is something like this here. Uh, there's another reason this reaction goes. Um, uh, what, what happens here is this. Uh, we get into something called a uh, partial reaction. Okay, normally we would say no reaction. NR. For no reaction. I mean, the no driving force is no reaction. But in this chapter, what we're going to do is we're going to look at partial reactions. Partial reactions. Partial reactions of this sort happen. Um, there's going to be a tiny bit of reaction that occurs. In this case, there's about 0.1% reaction that occurs. There is about 0.1% reaction. 99.9% .9 no reaction. Why do we have a tiny bit of reaction that occurred? Why we have a tiny bit of reaction is because um, of the collisions. This is because of the collisions. In order for this reaction to happen, the ammonia must collide with the water. And you know, how does the ammonia take the hydrogen from the water? Well, there's got to be a violent collision, a violent enough collision that breaks bonds. And so most of the collisions aren't violent enough. You know, uh, most of the collisions result in no reaction because uh, are things moving around? Yes. Things are moving around. And there are going to be collisions. And most of the collisions are okay, but sometimes there's a violent collision. Why is there sometimes a violent collision? It's because of this. We have something where we plot the population versus the kinetic energy. at room temperature. And so this is called a kinetic energy distribution curve. At 
room temperature, RT. Now, at room temperature, are all the molecules moving exactly the same speed? Like the air, are all the molecules of air moving at the exact same speed at room temperature? Each nitrogen is moving at the exact same speed as every other nitrogen? It turns out no. No. What we, what we see is we see uh, uh, that some are moving kind of slow and some are moving kind of fast. In other words, we, we see a whole population. Not everybody's the same. This is like, you know, if you go on, on a city block and you look at the temperatures fixed, but, you know, people are walking at different speeds. Is everybody going to walk at exactly the same speed? The molecules are going to be the same thing. You know, um, and so most of the molecules are moving here. So the largest population has this kinetic energy. But up here, some of these molecules have very high kinetic energies. It's a very small population, but there's a small population of high energy molecules. And this small population of high energy molecules, when they collide, damage is going to occur. That is, reaction is going to occur. And so what is that small population? Well, that small population is enough to cause 0.1% reaction, even though there's really no driving force, even though this reaction is unfavorable because we're making a much stronger base from a much weaker base. But the situation is, can you stop them from colliding? Is there a way to stop this reaction from occurring? In other words, can you stop it from colliding? Like here, if I have a cup of water, can I tell the water molecules do not collide with one another, stay separate? Is it possible? to stop them from moving, it's impossible. And so this is impossible. In other words, what we're going to create is a situation where we have a dynamic equilibrium established. A dynamic equilibrium is going to be established because these are highly reactive. Now, we have ammonium and a hydroxide. There's a very capable reaction for going backwards to form this. And so what happens is the, this, this occurs. Yes, this is unfavorable, and these products don't last very long. And so immediately, once these are formed, they can react and revert back to what's more stable, that. But the problem is you can't stop the collisions. The collisions are going to keep occurring. So what's going to happen is another set is going to collide and form more ammonium and hydroxide. And pretty soon, what we have is a dynamic equilibrium. What is a dynamic equilibrium? Well, it's an equilibrium because what's going to happen is this. 99.9% .9 is going to be like this, and 0.1 is going to be like this. But it's not static. That is, it's always changing. In other words, we're always forming more, and we're always going, yeah, going back or um, losing the product. And so what, what happens is, We'll, we'll hit, a, hit, hit a point where the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate and we've established an equilibrium. And when that happens, yes, it's 99.9% .9 this and only 0.1% that. It's not a 50-50 mix because this is much more stable. Does that make sense? Yeah, a dynamic equilibrium, ammonium is being produced. Think about this. Think if you have a ball pit. If you have a ball pit and a ramp, all the balls should be down here because that's the most stable energetically. And so if you have a ball pit and a ramp, then all the balls should be on the bottom of the pit. But what if you put the ball pit in motion, like popcorn or something? If you put the ball pit in motion, what's going to happen is one of these balls can roll up the ramp. Is that stable, to have a ball roll up the ramp? It's not stable, and this ball is going to roll right back down. Right? So is it stable to form these higher energy? This is like rolling up the ramp. Is it stable to form these higher energy products? No, what's going to happen is it's going to roll right back down. 
But the problem is, is you can't stop the next one from rolling right back up. So as soon as this one rolls back down, another one rolls up. And then pretty soon we hit a point where the number of balls rolling up is equal to the number of balls rolling down and we hit a state of, what do you call it? Dynamic equilibrium. And we're gonna get a steady state of, let's say four balls up the ramp. There's always four balls up the ramp, but those balls are always changing because it's dynamic. Does that make sense? And so, yeah, we're always going to have out of, let's say out of a thousand, we're always gonna have um, one set of these. 999 of these and one set of these. We're all, but this one set is always changing because it's rolling back the other way and the next ball is rolling up. Does that make sense? This is what we call a dynamic, this is what we call a partial reaction. Now why is this partial reaction important? Um, one of the reasons this partial reaction is important is one, it, it, um, it leads to some hydroxide formation here. And uh, the hydroxide can do two things. One, hydroxide can change the pH. You know, so if you put ammonia in water, the hydroxide will change the pH of the water and will no longer be pH 7. And so you might have started with pH 7 water, but that hydroxide is going to screw up the pH, and now the pH is going to be more like 9 or 10. Two, um, the hydroxide can cause metathesis reactions. Ammonium, what, what ions does ammonium precipitate with? What ions do ammonium ions precipitate with? Well, yeah, ammonium will react with hydroxide, but precipitate to form a solid. Group one and ammonium salts are all soluble. And so ammonium really doesn't um, doesn't really react in, in that sense, but hydroxide does because there are a lot of insoluble hydroxides. There are lots of insoluble hydroxides. And so um, this brings us to experiment three. Okay, so the two important things that happen here, pH changes because of the hydroxide. And two, ammonia can participate in metathesis reactions. And so in, uh, I think experiment three, we had a whole bunch of metathesis reactions, but then all of a sudden there's ammonia. In the typical metathesis reaction, we're doing AB plus CD like a double replacement, AB plus CD yields. But when we have something like this, I forgot, I should have looked at the compound. Does anybody remember what the ammonia was combined with? Cobalt? Or copper? Probably cobalt. It's on my slide. What's that? Experiment six. Experiment three. Got to bring my lab manual. 